Now, the the <clears throat> so Moses here is 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 um is saying that very thing, um, or Paul is saying it that that was what Moses uh, was describing that the righteousness um, which which is of the law uh, comes by doing. Meaning, uh, I like to think of it is what Moses was describing is that we must uh, live righteously constantly or continually. It's not something that you do once and say, okay, um, uh, I attained, I've, I've done it, it's finished, and now I can just go on and be a sinner. Um, not at all. It, is, it means that you must do right continuously. You must live righteously continuously. Now in contrast, how is one declared righteous under grace? All right, and we'll stay right there with Romans uh, chapter 10 and go backwards a verse to verse 4. Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So, with Christ, <clears throat> says he is the end of the law. So, in grace, we believe on Christ through faith, and we're saved. Under the law, what is the legal status of the whole human race? Well, we've already said that. And the answer is Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. So you can see it in scripture. But we know the answer. We've been talking about it all along. And that one of the things that we inherited um, was a sinful nature. And because sin is punished by death. Right? Sinners die. And so we are condemned to death. Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So we are guilty, found guilty, we're condemned, we're simply awaiting sentence, right? The death sentence to be executed. How many can save themselves by keeping the law? Romans 3 and verse 20. Well, we know that answer as well. None. Uh, none of us can save ourselves. And so thinking that um, by obedience to the law, perfect obedience to the law, never sinning, that is an impossibility. And so we fall short. Also, Here's the other problem that we have. I want you to understand this. Let's say hypothetically that a human being could keep the law perfectly. Right? But that's after having been born a sinner. And the law requires what for sin? It requires death. Then how do we pay the price? So that the that perfect obedience to the law cannot produce justification. Do you see? There's no power in it. The law doesn't have that power. And so even if we could keep it perfectly, we would not be saved or have eternal life. Because life, eternal life is in whom? And in whom only? Jesus. Jesus. And so he is just. If we're in him, remember we talked about baptism, being born into Christ, then being born again, um, then we die with him, we're resurrected with him, and he, because we are in him, 
we have eternal life. Those who are not, who don't believe, are condemned. They, they remain condemned, even if they could live up to the law perfectly, which they cannot, no one has done. What does it mean to be under grace? Now this is important. And now we're getting to, to me, the interesting part of the study. What does it mean to be under grace? Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 24. What does it mean to be under grace? See, many Christians will tell you right out there, clear. Oh, we're under grace. We're under grace. Uh, so we don't, we're not worried about that, that law-keeping uh, business. Well, there's truth and there's error there. The truth is, that's right, to be justified. If you're under grace, then it means that you have believed in Jesus, means that we have believed our condition, Okay, belief in Jesus lets us know what our condition is, that we're sinners in need of a Savior. We've accepted him as our Savior, and that his perfect obedience to the law, his death, and we die with him to this world, and his resurrection, which we believe in, um, provides us. We have then accepted his gift of salvation, we're saved. We have eternal life. It says we've passed from death to life. You remember that statement? Now, saved by faith, think of it as this. That being under grace means that we're saved by faith in Jesus' sacrifice and his righteousness. See, we're not saved, under grace, we're not saved by our performance but by faith in what Jesus did. You get that? That we are justified by faith. And our faith is in Jesus Christ. We have faith in what he did, his performance, not our own. Okay, Our own performance will, will lead to death. But acceptance and faith and belief in Jesus' performance is the gift of eternal life. Does our law keeping make any contribution to its justification by faith? Romans 3 and verse 28. Does keeping the law make any contribution whatsoever to our salvation? No. Absolutely not. Categorically, no. And that's why I said in the introduction that the there was there were polar opposites, law and grace, when it comes to salvation. Okay, and the reason is because our attempts to keep the law are insufficient to bring about justification or to justify us before God. And what we need is a Savior. And Jesus, on the other hand, his performance, his perfect obedience to the law is ours when we accept his gift. And he, and he gives it to us because it is something that we do not merit that has to do with the definition of grace. It means unmerited favor, a gift that we didn't earn. It's not payment for what we've done. It is simply a gift of love. And when we accept it, that's how we are saved. So what's the logical conclusion then? Paul makes it, and he draws it from this verse. What's yours? Romans chapter 11 and verse 6. What's the logical conclusion? <clears throat> Romans 11 and verse 6. I'm going to get it. I'll fetch it and post it. <clears throat> and there we are. 
But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Did you get that? If our righteousness is by, is by grace, the gift of God, then it is no longer on the basis of works. In other words, what we have done, our works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. It wouldn't be unmerited favor. It would be something that we were that was due us, something that we were being paid for our work. However, our works of righteousness, Scripture says, are as filthy rags. They are stained, marred, incapable, insufficient. Don't even get there, anywhere close to there all have sinned and therefore we're condemned to death so grace is the only means of salvation and if works were involved then grace would no longer be grace did you get that I hope so We can't, in other words, be saved by both methods. You see how these are polar opposites now. The works of the law, in other words, law keeping, obedience to the law, can't save us. And if it did, then there's no, it's not grace, because grace is unmerited favor. If it could, then we would be paid for what we did the work that we did and under grace it's nothing that we did but it's the gift of God that we receive through our belief in and it is it is it is a faith response right and as a result we're saved by means of grace and so what we can then say is that my salvation is not I, but Christ. And that's where Paul makes that statement that you know in Romans, not I, but Christ. There's a beautiful song um, by that title, not I, but Christ. So if we cannot be justified by works of the law, how are we justified? Well, we've talked about it all night tonight. We are justified through faith in the gift of Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. If you can post that for us, Spencer, I'd appreciate it. Because I think we ought to read it. Um, so that we understand it, it, it gets burned into our brains where it comes from in Scripture. That it's not just uh, Mr. Williams saying it. It's not just uh, Mr. Spellman saying it. It is from the Word of God. It's none of us just saying it. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Amen. I can help and fetch it. Um, and here we are. Verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not <clears throat> a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So a gift in grace, unmerited favor, has nothing to do with, with, with our works. It has all to do 
with the with the self-sufficient work of Christ on our behalf by the way and I'll make the tie between that last statement which is a, what love is all about um, agape love at the end of the study <clears throat> now does the justification by faith do away with the law in other words are we free in the sense of we don't need we no longer need to comply with the with the letter or the spirit of the law okay um, does this justification by faith do away with the law Romans chapter 3 and verse 31 Romans chapter 3 verse 31 gives the answer Romans chapter 3 in verse 31. I'll fetch it. No problem, Spencer. Uh, we, 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 you don't have any control over that. God bless you, and I do hope you feel better. Um, you relax. I, I can punch them up. Happy to do so. Um, look here. Here we here. Here it says, uh, "Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law." Ah, so Romans three thirty one is saying the law is not abolished because of grace. Hmm. I'll read you this comment. The word faith in this text is preceded by the definite article. Okay, um, The, the word the in the original. Paul's real question was, do we then make void the law through faith? By the faith, Paul is referring to the definite or to the doctrine of justification by faith and not the believer's faith. Do you get that? Paul's talking about the doctrine of justification by faith, not the believer's faith. <clears throat> In other words, did God ignore or bypass the law to save us? And the answer Paul gives is a definite no. God had to fully satisfy the law to save us. By his perfect obedience and his sacrificial death, Christ met the full demands of the law on man's behalf. And this is how the law was established by grace. I hope that uh, you can see that from this text now. May it never be, on the contrary, we establish the law so that the law is not nullified by grace. It is established or set in place by grace. Um, one more thing that I want to point out here. In, in, when we look at this definite article um, that precedes the word law, the, the law, what are we talking about? What is the law? The Ten Commandments? Other laws? It is the entirety of God's command. What Paul was referring to here is what we know today as the Torah. And the Torah are the books, the, first, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the, of the Bible, um, was considered the law. So it was not just the Ten Commandments, but it was the entire law, all of God's commands. Does a Christian saved by grace no longer need to keep the law? 
Hmm. That's a slightly different question. What do you say? Do we need to keep the law since we're saved by grace? We realize that it's, it's not done away with, but do we need to keep it if we're saved by grace? Answer provided by Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. and post it for you. I'll do each verse uh, independently so that I won't have trouble with it uh, breaking off. Um, and then we can read all three verses together because verse uh, 19 is lengthy. Verse 17, do not think that I came to abolish the law. This is Jesus speaking. Or the prophets. Ah, so that helps you understand why I said what I said about when I was talking about the definite article, the law. What was the law that's being referred to by, by Paul? And what I said is that it was the law in its entirety, not just the Ten Commandments. And now this makes it very plain here. In Matthew, Jesus is speaking. I didn't come to to abolish the law, the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish them, but to fulfill. Verse 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke. In the King James, it says, not one jot or tittle. Uh, two pieces of letters in 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 Hebrew shall pass away un until all is accomplished verse 19 whosoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven but whoever keeps and teaches them he shall be called greatest or great in the kingdom of heaven well, what's Jesus saying here? What's he saying? How do you read it? Well, let's tackle it bit by bit. When Jesus says that he didn't come, back in verse 17, he says, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. What does fulfill mean? How do you define fulfill? Well, what fulfill means here was to become or to take place or to, to be established. He uses the same contents, the same context is used in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 11. Let me post that for you and you'll see what I mean, that fulfilled means. Because I think it's, in, 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 it's important that we understand what it means that the law was, was fulfilled. Isaiah chapter 55 in verse 11 to help us understand fulfilled. So will my word be which so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. So when I told you it was the accomplishment it would accomplish, fulfill means to accomplish a purpose. This is an example of that word fulfilled in the Old Testament in Isaiah. There's another instance that describes it for us. Romans chapter 3, I mean chapter 8 and verses 3 and 4. Romans 8, 3 and 4. Look at this. Because we're trying to get 
a handle on this word, what does fulfilled mean? Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. And I'll fetch it. There it is. For what the law could not do, weak as it is through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, we're getting somewhere. How is it to be fulfilled in us? What does that mean? Well, I, 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 I you know, I, I, I just started, you know, searching this word because it, 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 it's so important. To fulfill, plero in the Greek, is to make full to fill full, okay, to fill something full, fill the cup full. And in the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> Jesus, the author of the law, has made it clear that the true meaning of its precepts, that's the law, and the way in which its precepts would find expression in the thinking and living of citizens of the kingdom of heaven, or his kingdom that he came to establish. The kingdom of grace, by the way. His first coming was to establish the kingdom of grace. The great lawgiver himself now reaffirmed the pronouncements of Sinai as binding upon those who would be his subjects and announced that everyone who should presume to annul them either by precept or example would in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's found in, in verse 20 of Matthew 5. The assertion that by fulfilling the moral law of Christ, by the, fulfilling the moral law, Christ abrogated the law, or he set it aside, is not in harmony with the context of Christ's statement. Such an interpretation denies the meaning Christ obviously intended to convey by making him virtually say contradictorily that he has not come to destroy the law but by fulfilling it to abrogate it. Do you see that? Um, you're familiar with the terms that I'm talking about, are, are, are you not? Because what I'm saying is that if Christ came and said I, I satisfy the law and now it is no more then the law what purpose did it have to begin with? Why would he give his life because of the demands of the law for us when the law was simply something to be done away with? Not at all. Let's continue. See, the Pharisees in Jesus' day accused him of undermining or doing away with the law. Yeah, it wouldn't make sense because it would be like setting people up for failure and then setting yourself up to commit suicide. <laughs> it's perfect. That's the perfect and simple and straight direct answer. Thank you, John. <laughs> but see, the Pharisees accused him of doing away with the law because he introduced grace. The Pharisees were the, if you want to, if you want to think of it as this, there's a scripture that says that the children of Israel were the, the, the holders of the oracles of God. The oracles meaning God's law. And so uh, you remember uh, Jesus when he talked to the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. And, um, and she said to him in their conversation, I know that salvation is of the Jews. Okay. So we're look, I'm looking forward to Messiah coming from the Jews. See, this woman understood this. All right? And so um, Jesus here is, 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 is um, trying to make clear for us that his coming and his grace, which satisfied the demand of the law, which was for blood, right? 
can't be remission of sin without the shedding of blood uh, which is why their goats and the bulls and the rams and the bit doves and all of those were slain and and their blood sprinkled on the altar sacrifice on the in the incense uh, burner and so forth um, that's why all of that um, occurred which pointed forward to Jesus coming and his blood being shed on Calvary shed blood in scripture is um, is a metaphor for death for death and so Jesus dies and as John pointed out it would just be ludicrous to think that he would die because of the law and then say okay now there's no law why didn't he just say there's no more law and there'd be no need to die right all right it was the demand of the law that there be death the the Pharisees though accused him of undermining the law or doing away with it because they saw grace as just too easy you know they had made um, the keeping of law a burden um, they'd added many regulations um, to the law to the laws and um, people found it impossible to to keep it and so they themselves wanted to re, to maintain that standard because they they, they they passed themselves off as 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 so righteous and so holy and that they were keepers of the law and they enjoyed that status and didn't didn't like Jesus coming and taking it away and saying to people who were not even Jews you can be saved if you believe in me and all you have to do is believe in me and you shall be saved. Pharisee said, oh no, 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 that will never do. And so he's come to do away with the law, which was not true. Jesus instead made it clear that he came to fulfill the demands of the law on man's behalf and then upheld it as the standard for Christian living. Ah, so now you see that third reason why the law was given that we st I started out in the introduction I said there were three reasons God gave the law one that it would it, it would show us sin it would help us to understand what sin was we didn't know sin until we had the law okay and uh, and so that was the, the the tutorial function of the law and the second thing was, and of course, in that tutorial function, because we were sinners, it showed us that we needed a savior. Then the second reason for the law was that it was the thing which Christ fulfilled. This is the standard that had to be met in order for there to be um, reconciliation between man and God. We would be in harmony. Our relationship would be mended that had been broken. And Jesus uh, uh, satisfied that with his righteousness. And then um, he goes further. And the third aspect was the standard for Christian. Just want to add a quick point to that. Go right ahead. Um, I also found it interesting that the law points out our need for a savior and so the law condemns us when we don't have a savior because we're guilty and so those who have a savior are no longer found guilty whereas those who refuse the savior are guilty already and uh, just by the fact that they have rejected the, the very savior who can give them victory over sin and uh, victorious lifestyle so um, the law serves as, a, as a, um, a way of pointing out who is on the Lord's side. It shows us that uh, uh, through our obedience, whether we're really followers of Christ or whether we're not. Amen. That, the, um, that uh, without the law, then we don't have a, a standard, uh, if you will. And with the law then um, there is that standard and it can be met um, in Christ um, we'll continue on that theme as we as we come towards the end of this uh, of this study and we're getting there 
How does Paul describe those who, who still want to be saved by the law instead of by grace? How does he describe them? Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. See, see the Galatians... To that, only through the Holy Spirit can the law be kept. Yes, that's true. It's only through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in, in our lives. That's correct. Um, because we are incapable of righteousness on our own. Isn't that correct? We, we receive and accept Christ's righteousness. Um, the Galatians accepted that. They believed the, in, the, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then um, some false teachers came along and began to convince them that that wasn't enough to be saved by Christ, but that they also needed to keep the law uh, for the, in order to be, to, to be saved. And what does Paul describe those who still want to keep the law as? Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. I'll fetch it and post it. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Ah, Paul says that we're slaves if we go back under the law and we have been freed from it. Under the law means that there was this yoke, this bondage. Um, and that Christ set us free from that through belief in him. Matthew 11, um, verses 28 and 29, talks about the yoke of, of Christ. Do you remember where Jesus says, Come unto me, ye that are heavy laden. What are you heavy laden from? From the burden of the law. And that's Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. I'll fetch that for you. An important scripture to remember. If you're uh, re taking notes, uh, write this one down because it's important. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. As opposed to law-keeping, which was this huge burden on us, Jesus says that making him our yoke, we would find rest. Rest from what? From the slavery of trying to keep the law. Christ is totally, or was totally God dependent when he was here on earth, and he made it clear that he could do nothing of himself. John chapter 5 and verse 30. And now he tells us as Christians to take his yoke and become totally dependent on him for salvation. And that's the only way that we can find rest or peace for our souls. Otherwise, we're tormented. When you look at your life, including your life today, you begin to come up with shortcomings as far as the law is concerned. And as we end, I'm going to expound on how we ought to view the law. And you'll see the totality of it and be able to say, Aha! The day that I had, which I thought was a pretty good day, um, involved some sins. 
So I failed at keeping the law. Woe is me. I'm guilty of death. I'll repent and ask the Lord for another opportunity. Well, when you're in Christ and you have accepted his sacrifice for you, then you are able to keep the law perfectly because of the Holy Spirit that's within you. Back uh, to um, Mr. Spellman's comment where he says, only through the Holy Spirit can the law be kept. So when we accept Christ, the Holy Spirit is present in us and we are able to keep the law fully. Why? Because of the third reason why God gave the law. It is a standard for Christian living. Does salvation by grace give us license to sin? Back to Galatians, verse <clears throat> chapter 5, verse 13. Does it give us a license to sin? Well, absolutely not. Um, <clears throat> Galatians 5 and uh, verse 13. I'll fetch and post it for you and then comment. For you were called to okay, free... Getting pardoned for a uh, speeding ticket and then thinking that you have a license to speed. <laughs> That's a great description. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, which is to do wrong or sin. But through love, serve one another. Ah. So as uh, Mr. Spellman is saying haven't had the speeding ticket you don't tear off and since you got a ticket and you're gonna pay for it it doesn't give you license to then speed instead you are obedient to the law for what purpose for the safety of all not just you but for the other people on the road all right Since our law keeping doesn't save us, the great danger we face under grace is, 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 con, is condoning sin. And that's cheap grace. Remember I defined that before? That um, being saved by grace gives us no such liberty. Instead it creates in us love for others and a hatred for sin. In loving others as ourselves, we are fulfilling what? The law. Aha. Uh -huh. Remember how Jesus summed up the law? L love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and mind. And the second, he gave the two great commandments, is like unto it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Love, love. And so when we love, you following me? In loving others as ourselves, we are doing what? We are fulfilling the law. And remember what the law is here. We're using this definite article. What we're talking about is not just the Ten Commandments, but all of the commandments that were given to Moses. And I think it's important to point out exactly how that is, that uh, keeping the law is... Um, Sorry, keeping the, those two commandments is keeping the law. The um, first four of the Ten Commandments <clears throat> is a is our duty to God. Thou shalt have no other gods. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in Thou vain. Just a little bit more. Huh? Yeah. And and the last six commandments are our duty to to each other. Um, don't kill, don't steal, don't covet, um, and so forth. Uh, go ahead, John.
Okay, we don't hear you right now, and uh, but if you if you want to expand on that, please uh, jump right in, and I'll pause when I hear you. Um, <clears throat> the remember what I was also saying about the law is that it include it, it included more. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. I was just going to point out um, if you have if you love God, are you going to have another God besides God? Um, if you love God, are you going to uh, make a graven image and, and bow to it? Are you going to uh, say the Lord's name in vain? Are you going to break the Sabbath? So that's how the, uh, the first four commandments deal with love for God. And that's the very first commandment that Jesus mentioned. He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Uh, now, as far as the other six, if you love your fellow man, are you going to rob him? Uh, steal from him, murder him, lie to him? Are you going to dishonor your parents if you love them? And so when you break any of those commandments, you're actually breaking uh, the commandment that Jesus mentioned, which was, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So really, those two commandments, love the Lord your God and uh, love your neighbor as yourself, are just a summary of the Ten Commandments. And, 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 and that is correct, 100% correct. And not only that, not only that, they are um, they are some of, of also what we know as the Mosaic Law. Um, if you go to Deuteronomy and look at the, the it's some of the expanded um, witness of law there, uh, where <clears throat> it covers. Um, how you were supposed to deal with someone else in terms of debt, how you were to deal with uh, women, uh, respect for women, uh, and so it goes on and on and on and on and on. How you dealt with slaves or servants, all of those things are encompassed under acts of love. In the New Covenant, where does God write his law? Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. Where does he write the law? Instead of on the tables of stone or in the book of the law, the Torah, um, where does he write it? Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. Well, he writes it in our hearts or on our hearts. And Hebrews chapter 10, I'm fetching it now, and, uh, and I will post it so that we can see it. <clears throat> For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. And by the way, the reason why it's in capitals here, I happen to take this from the New American Standard Version, the reason it's in capitals is to alert you to the fact that it's a quotation of the Old Testament. And it's specifically a, a, a quotation of Jeremiah 31. And you'll find this text there. But here it's found in Hebrews 8 and verse 10. Paul quotes it. He's quoting Jeremiah. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their inward minds, or into their minds, which, and I will write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So <clears throat> the answer to the question, where does God write? His law in the new covenant on on our hearts. What was what when God's strength or His grace is 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 His grace was made perfect in Paul. When when was it made perfect in Paul? God's strength or His grace. When was His grace made perfect in Paul? Second Corinthians chapter twelve and verse nineteen. I'll read it for you. 2 Corinthians, if you're following in, in your Bibles, and you should, <clears throat> uh, chapter 12 and verse 9, and it reads, <clears throat> And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Christ's grace is most active in us when we are weak and we understand our weakness. And that's why Philippians 4.13 is such a powerful text. It's a promise that I can do all things 
in Christ who or through Christ who strengthens me because we're weak we can rely on Christ to strengthen us when we are weak then we see his strength at work next question <clears throat> besides being saved what were we created in Christ to do Ephesians 2 verse 10 there's another purpose in t besides being saved and we talked about this um, when we talked about baptism um, and um, I wanted to to bring it back to your memory here um, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 I'll post this one we're just about at the end we finished in five minutes for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works uh -huh. so here we are almost full circuit now we're beginning to take these two polar opposites with respect to salvation law and grace and we're bringing them together after we've accepted the grace of Christ then we see the purpose of the law or the works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them walk in them is meaning that our lives will be guided by the principle by which we live our lives is God's law and so the law is never abrogated done away with thrown away Instead, people will see in our behavior that we are law keepers. We have moved from a life of sin, which is law breaking, to a life of good works, which is law keeping. And it's manifested by our love for others. John 13 and verse 35 shows you that. John 13, 35. I'll post that one quickly. And when I do, you're going to know this. You say, oh yeah, I know that text. I remember that. <clears throat> And there I would it is. also add the text uh, from Romans 2 about the law of the heart. Very well. And here it is. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another, or if you love one another. And that is the greatest evidence that we can give, that we give, that we are followers of Jesus Christ meaning that we've accepted his gift of grace and in accepting that grace where he empowers us to live a holy life which is a life that is guided by the law and the law is love to God and love to our fellow man so the evidence that we are living righteously that our life is changed from our old old lives is when we love one another how does the Bible last question describe the last generation of Christians Rome uh, Revelation chapter 12 last book of the Bible Roman Revelation chapter chapter uh, 14 and verse 12 Revelation 14 and verse 12 how does the Bible describe the last generation of Christians followers of Jesus Christ after these people die or many of them will not die they'll be present when Jesus comes the, the second time here is the patience or the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus Christ and so therein is the harmony of law and grace 
We believe in Jesus and we keep the commandments. But the keeping of the commandments is not for our salvation. Our salvation is complete in Christ Jesus. But the commandment to love God and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves permeates our very being because it's been written where's God's law it's now in written in our heart in our mind all right and so we do acts of love and that's why God said Jesus said that when he came he gave a parable and he gave and he said that there he talked about sheep and goats and separating them but then he also said that the people that are going to go to heaven those that are going to be saved are those whose works were what they visited the sick and imprisoned they fed the hungry you see they were they they were acts of kindness acts of love acts of selflessness and so we're called upon as followers of Christ to accept his incredible gift, but not only to, to, to assent to it or to believe it intellectually, intellectually, but to make it so much a part of us that it just comes out of us, that we live our actions, our acts of love. In the book of James, James spends a lot of time um, teaching us that faith is one thing, but the proof of that faith, we're not going to be saved unless they're acts of love. And that love, the love that constrains us, actually comes from the law. So the law has never been done away with, never will be done away with, as we found out in Isaiah 55, where it said that it will be fulfilled. And the fulfillment is what? That we live lives of love, loving one another. It's a transcript of God's character, is love. Then the law is central and will be eternal, or is eternal. God's law is eternal. It's no longer bondage to us because we've taken on Christ's yoke and with the yoke of Christ there's freedom from the slavery of the law now law keeping is such a blessing and such a benefit and we can look forward to it I hope God has blessed you in this study I hope that there's some clarity now about law and grace that are at polar opposites when it comes to our salvation because we're saved by grace alone. But there is harmony between law and grace with respect to Christian living. God bless you. Thursday we will um, plan to tackle um, our next topic. Um, and if you're following along in the, uh, in the theme of things, it's going to be the blessed hope. Um, and um, and then after we do that, next week we'll get into some of the doctrines that are impacted by that. One of them, we the first one I wanted to talk about, we really already covered. It's the Godhead itself. Uh, we talked about Trinity. Um, and, uh, and then we'll jump into creation and then go for some other ones, uh, uh, stewardship and so forth. But uh, for the moment, uh, we're going to finish this part, uh, this segment, with uh, the blessed hope on Thursday. May God bless you. Remember if you wish to contact us you may do so uh, through the email address. Uh, if you have some questions, if there are some topics that you would like us to uh, present, we're happy to do that. Please let us know. Invite your friends. Invite a friend who you love and you care about and you want to be saved. That's uh, for you to do. The um, the, web, the website is inspiritednetwork.com, um, inspiritednetwork, all one word, dot com. 